Welcome to the Tax Factor, the top 20 business and investment podcast from Blick Rothenberg, the tax, accounting and business advisory firm. This week with Matt Crawford and Ellie Theachari. I'm Matt Crawford. And I'm Ellie Theachari. And welcome to The Tax Factor, the top 20 business and investment podcast that keeps you up to date on all of the latest tax news. So this week, someone in our risk team must be on holiday as I've been let loose on the microphone as this week's presenter. Fortunately, I'm joined by Ellie, who will keep me on the straight and narrow. This week, we're going to be talking about the mandatory payrolling of benefits, a principal private residence claim that went rather wrong, and some HMRC time to pay arrangements. But firstly, rarely can a story be described as sensational in the tax world, but this one really is. Ellie, I understand you've been pondering the difference between a crisp and a poppadom. That's right. So last week, the first tier tribunal rejected an appeal by the manufacturers of Walker's crisps, who unsuccessfully tried to argue that its range of sensations poppadoms were not subject to VAT at the standard rate. Walker's first tried to argue that they intended for poppadoms to be eaten as a side or with a dip and therefore required some kind of preparation, which would mean that they could not be standard rated but then unfortunately had to withdraw this argument when they realised that their packaging and adverts showed a number of individuals eating the poppadoms straight from the packet. Instead, Walker's attempted to rely on their interpretation of the part of the VAT Act which defines products similar to potato crisps, potato sticks or potato puffs made from the potato, potato flour or potato starch. HMRC contended that the approximate 40% potato content of the product was great enough to meet this definition and the first tier tribunal agreed. My favourite part of the judgment for those of us that had a read is the rejection of Walker's argument that by calling the snack a poppadom changed its treatment. The judge stated that nominative determinism is not a characteristic of snack foods. Calling a snack food hula hoops does not mean that one could twirl that product around one's midriff, nor is Monster Munch generally reserved as a food for monsters. Absolutely fantastic yeah. <laughs> piece in there. I really, really enjoyed that as well. I think my favourite bit of the judgment is probably the part where walkers, they try to introduce evidence that if people were purchasing sensations at poppadoms or were intending to purchase sensations poppadoms, if those poppadoms weren't available, then they would buy alternative poppadoms. Now, whilst 58% of people stated that they would indeed select uh, an alternative poppadom if sensations wasn't available. It also found that 84% would buy another potato crisp. And so rather their own survey undermined their own argument. So I thought that was rather fantastic. And that, that really is one of my favorite cases I've seen for a very long time. The next topic we wanted to cover today is the mandatory payrolling of benefits, which HMRC announced last week would come into force from April 2026. And to recap a little bit on what payrolling of benefits actually is, at the moment, let's give an example. Your employer, say, uh, buys you a season ticket to Birmingham City Football Club at a cost of £12 per annum. And that at the moment, if you get that at the end of the tax year, that £12 can go on your P11D. Your employer will pay Class 1A national insurance on that £12 benefit. And through the next tax year, HMRC, probably around August time, they will give you a new notice of coding. And that notice of coding will effectively change the amount of PAYE that you need to pay over the course of the next year to pay back that benefit. So that's the kind of the current arrangement. Um, but mandatory payrolling of benefits is going to mean that instead what you need to do is that £12, you'll have to divide it by 12 over the entire year and put an extra pound through the payroll as a notional payment and collect the tax that way. Now, there's got there's a number of issues with that. It is simpler in the sense that it reduces the amount of forms that need to be provided because you won't need to provide a P11D. But there are a number of issues that we've spotted, one of which is that in the 26-27 tax year, there will be people that are paying the benefits benefit on kind from the year before, but also paying the benefit in kind in the current year because you're payrolling it through the payroll right now. And of course, you know, with the cost of living crisis, that could be really, really difficult for a number of people. And I think you know, one of the key takeaways here is that employers are definitely going to have to alert their employees to the fact that this is going to happen because they could see a really quite substantial reduction in their net pay. I think the, the other challenge that with this is a lot of payroll providers, they do get this wrong. You have to put this notional element through the payroll, which can be a little bit challenging because you have to actually set up a specific element that means that you're not actually going to pay anybody. And what I've actually seen in the past is people, they actually end up paying people too much net pay as well as charging the tax on the benefit in kind. So there's a number of issues that need to be ironed out there. And I think, you know, we'll be 
will be responding to any consultations that HMRC have on this particular idea to payroll benefits. So now on to another piece of case law this week where the FTT considered the evidence which was needed to be kept to ensure that a claim for principal private residence relief can be successful. Yes, so there was a taxpayer who had claimed £43,000 of capital gains tax relief on the basis that he was selling a residential property that was his principal private residence for around half the time he owned that property. He wasn't actually able to produce any bills which were in his name for the time he claimed that he lived there and his reason being that he claimed he regularly visited his family to pick up his post and didn't necessarily want his ex-wife to see some of the information that would usually be contained within those bills. He was actually able to show some correspondence sent to him at that address So there were some mortgage statements, some water bills, some invoices, but he hadn't actually registered to vote at that address and no evidence from his ex-wife or the lodger who he shared that property with could actually back up what he was saying. There's nothing at all technically groundbreaking in this case, but it does serve as a valuable lesson regarding the burden of proof being upon the taxpayer to show that an HMRC assessment is wrong and not the other way around. The tribunal even did say that what the appellant was asserting as a quote was not improbable, but that he simply didn't have the evidence that he needed to back up these claims and therefore for the case had to be rejected and the taxpayer ended up with quite a significant tax bill, which perhaps could have been avoided had he been keeping better records at that time. Speaking of which, the issue of unexpected tax bills is, of course, on a lot of people's minds at the moment with the upcoming self-assessment deadline on the 31st of January. Matt, I know you've been looking into how people are deferring their tax bills through using HMRC's time to pay arrangements. Can you run me through some of that? Yeah, sure. So um, already, and we're you know a few days away from the self-assessment deadline, not until next week, but already 7.7 million people have filed their self-assessment tax returns. And as you all have heard Nimesh and I talking about last week, it's really important to remember that that deadline isn't just the deadline for filing the tax return, it's also the deadline for payment. And of those 7.7 million people who had filed returns, it was announced that 44,800 of those people couldn't afford to make a payment uh, a payment in full of their tax liability. And so have got in place with HMRC what we call a time to pay arrangement. And those time to pay arrangements simply allow you to defer the tax that uh, that is that is due over a longer period of time. Now, if you earn under £30,000, then you can use an online HMRC affordability calculator to see whether it might be possible to do that deferral and and over what sort of period. If you earn more than £30,000, you have to do a more formal application to HMRC for a time to pay arrangement. And typically what that means doing is you have to provide some kind of statement of income, statement of expenditure for corporates, more of a detailed cash flow statement would be necessary for individuals, perhaps something slightly less detailed is is often possible. And special permissions are often needed for particularly long periods of time and long, long deferral arrangements. Now, really important to remember, especially with interest rates much higher than they were, that these things can be really, really expensive. And if you do enter a time to pay arrangement, but then find subsequently you do have more cash than you expected, then you can make additional payments to reduce the amount of interest that's due. But they are a, a useful thing to do to avoid late payment penalties and get your tax affairs in order. It is worth noting, and one of my uh, colleagues this week had a, there was a bit of inconsistency in the revenue. So one of my colleagues this week, they had a case, it was an IR35 case case where an amount of pay as you earn was due that hadn't been paid. And the particular revenue inspector came back to them and said, no, a time to pay arrangement isn't possible in this circumstance, because we don't believe the individual has got enough cash up front to pay for this bill. So it was a some, somewhat of a catch 22 that that particular client was left in. So it is worth knowing that you know you can push back when the revenue do say that time to pay arrangements aren't possible. And it is worth escalating within the revenue system when that happens. Ellie, I I remember listening to the last time you were on The Tax Factor with Rahanna and you were getting in a bit of a panic about the fact that you had to make sure that everything was sold on your online platforms. And that became quite a story uh, in the press over the the coming days. Yes, it was indeed. And as you said, that story really took off. I think there was quite a lot of misunderstanding about who does and doesn't need to let HMRC know about the bits and bobs they're selling online, mainly because the rules about when you have to complete a self-assessment tax return haven't actually changed. So for those of us that work in tax, we already knew that knew these rules, but it was being badged as a new side hustle tax, which got a lot of people scared. For our listeners, rest assured, if you're selling an old bike or some baby clothes, the rules are extremely unlikely to apply to you. 
That's probably all we've got time for this week. My thanks to Ellie Theachari. As we covered in detail last week on The Tax Factor, remember you've got until midnight on the 31st of January to file your online tax return. If you do want any hints and tips on filing your return and making payments on time, then do listen to last week's Tax Factor, where Nimish and I discussed our top tips for self-assessment filing. That's The Tax Factor. We'd like to thank you for making us one of the UK's top 20 podcasts. Find all our previous episodes wherever you get your podcasts. And join us again next time on The Tax Factor. Tax Factor.